from the Old Testament book of Exodus chapter 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but sowing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the earth the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land of the Lord that the Lord is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. I invite you to read responsively with me Psalm 19. The commandment of the Lord gives light to the eyes. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning sight. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives our soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Our second reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided, through the foolishness of our proclamation, to save those who believe. 
For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to John, the second chapter. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus Christ. Well, we continue in our Lenten journey, and today we're continuing our conversation about God's covenants in preparation for receiving a new, the new covenant in Jesus Christ risen. You know, we've heard a lot about God's covenant in the last several weeks, the first one being the covenant with Noah and all creation. The Noahic covenant is God's pledge that God will preserve the stability of nature. This stability will allow God's people to flourish. Moreover, our Creator's love for all that God has made is seen in this pledge that God will never again destroy the world. And it's also an early sign that one day all creation will be renewed. We've also heard about God's covenant with Abraham and Sarah. God promises to make Abraham and his ancestors a multitude of nations. God will make one particular nation of Abraham's descendants, and kings shall come from that lineage. And God promises a land, the promised land for this nation. And today, we're looking at the granddaddy of them all, the Ten Commandments, right? This is the central covenant of Israel's history. The Ten Commandments are the gift of law to those God freed from slavery in Egypt. The commandments begin with the statement that because God alone has freed the people from all the powers that oppress them, they are to let nothing else claim first place in their lives. The covenant is simple. God will be their only God, and the people, being God's people, will follow God's instruction. And this is a continuation built on the foundation of the covenant with Abraham and Sarah. The commandments provided the framework for living as God's people, and thus a nation was shaped, and that nation was to be blessed, to be a blessing. 
Now, if you're like me when you think about the Ten Commandments, you might have the image of a technicolor Charlton Heston as Moses descending from the mountain with those tablets as a sign in hand. You know, that portrayal of that movie is Exodus, the book of Exodus, and dramatically portrays the giving of the Ten Commandments as found in the book of Exodus. And that is our first reading for this morning. Law. We hear a lot about law. Law and order, law and justice, law and gospel. So what is law? In the Old Testament, the word law is used to translate the word, the Hebrew word, Torah. And that means instruction. And that word is derived from the verb hora, which is to point, to guide, to instruct, and teach. Hence, the law is that which provides authoritative guidance. In the New Testament, the Greek word used for law is nomos. Nomos means that which is assigned, hence usage and custom, and then law or rule for governing, governing one's actions. Today, there's no universally accepted definition of law. In general, law is a system of rules and guidelines which are enforced through social institutions to govern behavior. Some say law is a science, others say it is an art. The history of law closely links to the development of civilization. And these are just a few examples. Ancient Egyptian law dating back as far as 3000 BCE was based on the concept of ma'at. Ma'at refers to the ancient Egyptians and their understanding of truth, balance, order, harmony, morality, and justice. And ma'at was also the name of the goddess who personified these concepts and regulated the stars the seasons, and the actions of mortals and deities whom they believed brought order from the chaos at the moment of creation. Then there's the Mesopotamian Code of Hammurabi, and that dates back to 1700 BCE. It was a compilation of almost 300 laws on every aspect of human life. Now, we can't be sure how well enforced these laws were, but it is safe to say that a powerful king in ancient Mesopotamia's past thought these were the laws that would guide a just society. And that code was a compilation of earlier codes, which included those of the Sumerians and the Akkadians. Now we get to the Ten Commandments. It is estimated that the Ten Commandments were given to Moses on Mount Sinai or Mount Harib, same place, around 1300 BCE. Here today, we are talking about this set of laws given well over 3,000 years ago. Why? Well, certainly God's people at the time had lived under Egyptian law, but not as citizens, but as slaves. Slaves had no rights or recognition under the law except that as owned property. In our reading from Exodus, God has delivered God's people from slavery and safely led them out to the desert. God's people needed guidance. They needed to be shaped into a nation. A new society was being born out of that freedom and God's intention. God's people needed guidance, a foundation, a, something to help them live together, to grow together, and to travel together. Now, in Deuteronomy 5, Moses recounts what happened in the original giving of the Ten Commandments, but now it's 40 years later and the people are preparing to enter into the promised land. So Moses reminds them, and he says, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances that I'm addressing to you today. 
You shall learn them and observe them diligently. The Lord our God has made a covenant with us at Harab. Not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here today. Moses then recounts the commandments given. In the next chapter, in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, Moses tells the people the intention of the laws given. Moses tells them to observe the law so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord all the days of their life. It's, Moses tells them so it's that your days may be long, so that it may go well with you. He says so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey as God has promised your ancestors. Again, a reminder of the covenant made with Abraham and Sarah. The law was intended as a gift, that in following them the people would be blessed, whole and prosperous, blessed to be a blessing. About 1,300 years later, Jesus reinterprets the commandments in Matthew 22 and Mark 12, and both share the same story. Jesus is asked which commandments in the law is the greatest. Jesus answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus takes all the laws, ordinance and statutes and provides this summative ultimate set of commandments. Love God, love people, including yourself. The law of God is love. The law was always intended by God to be gospel, to be good news. The problem is that the law and following it became law separated from the intentions. It was separated from the loving relationship between people and God. One was judged on how well they followed the law and works became necessary to justify oneself. Faith and forgiveness were not part of the equation. It was believed that righteousness could be attained through works as prescribed by the law. The reality though is that we people, human beings are not capable of following God's commands. All of them, all the time. Salvation does not come through the law we can't complete the law perfectly on our own. The law becomes that by which we measure our failure and our brokenness and leaves us coldly convicted and afraid. How is this good news? The law has been fulfilled and fulfilled by one and only one, and that was Jesus. Jesus had no sin. He as God completed the requirements of the law for us. As children of God, beloved and made holy, saved by grace, the law has no power over us. We are citizens of God's kingdom made so through baptism into Christ's death and resurrection. The law only functions to drive us to the cross in our brokenness. And at the foot of the cross, we see the consequences of our sin and the one who saves us. In recognition of the price paid for our freedom from the law, we're called in relationship, in love, to be faithful and to live lives of devotion. Christians do not have to follow the law to be saved, but do so in response to what has been given. 
in response to what God has done through Jesus. We love. We love God. We love ourselves. We love our neighbor. We follow the law, not out of fear, not because we have to, but out of love and devotion. We follow the law not because we, we are required to. That requirement is gone. Now it's all about relationship. Because we love God, we obey. God's Holy Spirit is that which helps make us move from fear to loving obedience. Yes, we mess up. <laughs> yes, we sin. But God does not hold it against us because of Jesus and his sacrifice. This is why we still teach and learn the Ten Commandments. They are good. They will help our days go long. The commandments also continually remind us how much we need Jesus. In our gospel, we heard the story of Jesus cleansing the temple Commerce and profiteering had become the center of the activity in God's house. Jesus responds in righteous anger and zeal. Commandments were being broken. When asked what sign Jesus could prove, provide to prove his authority in doing such a thing, Jesus replies, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus is speaking of himself as the true dwelling place of God when he refers to himself as this temple. Jesus did what he did with God's own authority. Jesus also foretells of his resurrection three days after his crucifixion. Jesus will die on the cross to save God's people from the spiritual consequences of sin and will rise again to make the way of salvation for us. God completes God's own law. As Christians, we proclaim Christ crucified. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And in our reading from 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul rightly says, this is foolishness to the world. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit can we recognize our own brokenness and recognize the goodness and grace of God given through Jesus Christ? We are saved by God's love, love that was not earned, love that came to earth, love that healed the sick and raised the dead, love that died on the cross and rose again, love that ascended into heaven and will come again. Love freely given. God calls us to love in return. Love God. Love neighbor. Love yourself. On this foundation, God calls all of us to live. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of the commandments. May we, in loving response to what you have done for us, follow them. And when we don't, may we turn around into repentance. And may we be assured of your forgiveness and love. For the greatest gift of all, for your Son, Jesus Christ, we give you thanks and praise. Amen.